please welcome Elizabeth Murphy of McKinsey and Company. Elizabeth will facilitate our luncheon discussion, Women in the Workplace. It's time to Okay, it's wonderful to be with y'all today. My name is Elizabeth Murphy. I'm a partner with McKinsey in Atlanta. Facilitated discussion, don't worry, you can eat lunch. I might ask you to raise some hands. Um, but the number one thing I wanna do is just give you some food for thought um, and, and maybe some concrete pieces to take back with you to your organizations about um, women in the workplace, where we are today and how we can continue to um, advance across our workplaces. So I'll, if we can queue up content, that's great, thank you. So just uh, um, you know, for those who aren't familiar with it, McKinsey, so we're a global management consulting firm, um, but over the past nine years, we've partnered with Lean In to um, do, put out a report on where do we stand with women in the workplace today. Um, and this came out of our research and our recognition that Sometimes when it comes to changing mindsets, changing policies, the best thing that we can do is bring data to, um, to the problem and understand why the case for change is already there if we understand the numbers better. So in our research over the past nine years and before that, what we have, um, what we found is that the business value behind diversity is there and the reason for organizations to focus on these problems and to focus on enabling broader participation in the workforce, broader advancement, just impacts the bottom line. Organizations that are top quartile for gender representation are 27% more likely to outperform financially. And organizations that are top quartile for ethnic diversity are 13% more likely to outperform financially. So when we understand that it's good for our business to enable and empower women, to enable and empower a more diverse workforce, all of a sudden the questions around why aren't we doing this, why do our teams not more diverse today, become not just the, well, we think it's a good idea, to it's an imperative for the performance of our organization. Um, so across the past nine years, we've, we've done this research, we have hundreds of companies surveying their employees, and the interesting thing has been being able to see what's changed just a little bit year to year, then, you know, COVID disruption, lots of flexibility, lots of policies changing, more of a jump ball for how we come together as a workforce. Um, and so some of these trends have changed quite a bit just in the past couple of years. So first thing to talk about is just where's our pipeline? Um, and here you'll see, you know, over the past five years, um, down at the bottom, when you flow through from entry level, manager, senior manager, VP, all the way up to the C-suite, we are seeing gains. However, they're slow um, and they are, we would say, fragile. Um, we are not seeing, you know, the double digit year over year growth that you would expect to see um, in a real swing, especially at the top. Uh, but it is encouraging to see, you know, for example, when uh, the C-suite, a six-point increase in representation um, there from, from five years ago. So we're making some progress. It's slow, probably for everybody in this room, certainly not as quickly as we would, we would want. Um, and so then our, our question that we ask as a firm is, how do we speed it up? Like, how, what are the real barriers that we can do something about? And that's what I'd um, hope that y'all will take with you today. So a few myths that we wanted to focus on in this year's research. <coughs> and I, I expect some of these will feel familiar. Women are becoming less ambitious, or women are less ambitious. Um, you know, how many folks in this room, show of hands, have ever had an opportunity where you felt like you were passed over, perhaps because someone didn't know that you had your hand up? Okay, so good, a good number. Um, we see in the data that women are more ambitious than they ever have been before, and that flexibility is enabling that ambition. And in fact, there is a you know, parity between men's ambition and women's ambitious, ambition. Second one is we talk a lot um, in the space about the glass ceiling. In our research, what we've seen 
is much more impactful is what we call the broken rung. Where is the place where the pipeline starts to fall off a bit for women and men? And how can organizations hone in on that as the opportunity to have a bigger impact in women's advancement? The third, um, microaggressions, and here we're defining this broadly, we'll go into this a bit later, but you know, the things that make you not at your best in your workplace, they have a micro impact. What we see is that actually they have huge impact um, and they have a disproportionate impact for women. Um, and then lastly, that flexible work, you know, our jump ball from the pandemic is something that women want, but it may not be the right thing for the whole organization. Um, we see that both men and women benefit from and value flexibility in the workplace. So we'll go into each of these um, in a bit more depth. On ambition, uh, I think this one is pretty cool. So what we're looking at here is, um, think about this as, you know, if you put 100 people in a room, how many of them have their hand up? How many are saying, I want to advance, I want to be considered for the next promotion? Um, Instead of folks having their hands down, I'm happy where I am, I don't want to take on more responsibilities, we see that men and women are about equally ambitious. Women's ambition is increasing faster than men. Um, so this is when we're looking at, you know, generationally across the workforce, um, women are becoming more ambitious, you know, younger, uh, starting families, um, you know, dealing with lots of, of challenges over the course of a lifetime, but still have their hands up and more so, um, you know, from a growth standpoint than men. So a, a clear myth to bust on that front. <coughs> and the growth here, where is it coming from? This is some of what COVID has enabled for us. Um, so when we look at um, what flexible work has done, Flexible work has enabled more women to stay in the room with their hands up longer. So if you see 36% of ambitious women who would have had to leave, who would have had to put their hands down um, without additional flexibility, that's what's fuel fueling that growth. If you break that down, 56% of women with young children, 47% of women with disabilities, and then 45% of Gen Z women, and Gen Z, you know, broadly valuing lifestyle balance um, more, but we are sustaining ambition longer um, with more flexible work here. I'll talk next about the broken rung. Um, and we say here, the broken rung is a greater obstacle than the glass ceiling. We're not saying that the glass ceiling doesn't exist. If you go back to the pipeline we were looking at earlier, um, certainly you know, some real constraints at the top um, and the mobility when you're moving from VP to SVP to the C-suite is there. But what we like to focus on is the broken rung because the broken rung is something that tactically organizations focusing on this does make a big difference. So in the data, what we see is that for every 100 men who are promoted to manager, 87 men are promoted. So this is your entry level to manager transition. And then only 73 women of color were promoted to manager. 82 women of color in our last year's survey were promoted. So this is a step back. At the end of the day, if you have the opportunity as an employer um, or helping to influence the way that your employer coaches, creates opportunities for managers. Um, are you thinking about parity there? Are you looking at this data? This is the number one thing from a pipeline standpoint that you can do to impact the overall trend. So let's double click a little bit into the broken rung for black women and Latinas. You'll see here that for every um, for women overall, uh, black women and Latina women in particular are more ambitious, but the numbers are really not in their favor in terms of actually having that opportunity created. So at that managerial level, that first step increase in responsibility, uh, this is where people are being left out and assuming that someone may not want an additional responsibility, may not want an opportunity, doesn't have her hand up, this is, is um, having a disproportional impact. The next one is microaggressions, um, large and lasting impact. So 
here, when we're talking about microaggressions, well, I'll, I'll skip forward um, one page first because I think it's helpful just to talk about what some of these things are. So these are, are behaviors that you're, ex the things that you're experiencing in the workplace that I would say make you a less great version of yourself. You know, when you feel like you have to change your appearance, when you feel like someone else is taking credit for your ideas, you need to change your tone, your words, you can't speak up to share your opinion. And when I look down the left-hand column of this chart um, at all men, and then the next column of all women, and then break it down from there, you know, the, in some cases, doubling of feeling like you're not your best self um, is something that you can imagine has a major impact over the course of a career. And these can be little things. Um, if I go back, you know, in terms of how women experience the, these, you know, women are much more likely to experience microaggressions in the first place, but then they are exponentially more likely to make you want to leave your current environment. I think back to the Sheryl Sandbergism here of, you know, the running the marathon. If you're running a marathon and people are cheering you on, you feel like you're at your best, um, you keep running and you're going to get a much better, much better time. You're going to run a better race. If you're running a marathon and you feel like someone's running alongside you and saying, why are you running? You don't have to be running right now. Um, other people are better runners. Other, other people are meant to run a marathon. Your time goes up, I guess, not down. Uh, but at the end of the day, you're not going to run your best race. And these are the things that, that make us feel like we need to leave. Let's talk a little bit more about flexibility. Um, so flexibility, there's a, a myth here that we want to bust around uh, how we are taking advantage or not taking advantage of flexibility uh, after COVID. So just by a show of hands, how many folks here have returned to a fully in-person workplace and have that policy? Okay, so it looks like maybe 20%. How about hybrid? Okay, and how about fully remote? No fully remote, interesting. Or, or oh, what, one, I see one, sorry, one fully remote. Um, and how about no policy in place? Do what makes sense for you. Okay, also interesting. So this is one, you know, we're talking a lot about it in terms of families, in terms of caregiving. Um, obviously, we hear some on the productivity front. But at the end of the day, everyone values flexibility over when and where they work. So when we survey employees, flexibility, the opportunity to work remotely and control over when and where you work, is second only to healthcare benefits. So when we look at, you know, as employer, when you're looking at this, um, if you're looking at, you know, some of the, the leave benefits that are costly. Not to say that the opportunity to work remotely um, or, or flexibly is not costly, but in terms of how employers are thinking about this, adding in a new program for well-being, a new employee benefit, um, versus opening up some flexibility in, in how your employees are able to work actually does make a big difference. Um, on this one, too, there's a disparity between how employers are thinking about it and how employees value it. 44% of employers think that this is important, but as you can see, 70% of employees think that this is important. So at the end of the day, um, when, we, when we're looking at this, we see parity between how women and men are experiencing it. And you know our horizons have been stretched around what's possible. Certainly, we had, we don't have it figured out, but just to say that this this does matter for everyone. Um, but wanting to work flexibly is not the same as wanting to work 100% remote. So within the data here, what we see is um, you do have some some holdouts who are uh, wanting to be. 100% on site. Some of that might be professionally driven, some of it might be personality driven, uh, but, but some folks, a minority, want to be fully on site. The majority of folks want to be some version of remote or hybrid. Um, and within that hybrid, what we see is, you know, the two to three days on site is, is a, a big one. Um, this is showing up more for parents, for mothers of young children, and for dual career couples. Um, and when we see this group, you know, 
that as a, a determining factor between job A or job B comes into play. I know from conversations with many employers in Georgia, um, you know, the, the policy that your organization does or does not have can be a deal breaker. Um, so think of it not just as an enabler of your pipeline of, of women um, thriving, you know, growing, but also one that, that could help you attract or might inhibit you attracting the best talent. So I think this one is also interesting. When we think about hybrid, we, at least I assume, that hybrid is uh, really different from remote entirely. You know, most organizations um, have moved to some sort of appreciation for collaboration, some sort of appreciation for our culture comes out in the way that we work together in person. It's really hard to sustain that um, in an entirely remote world. What we see, though, in the data is that um, hybrid looks like much more like remote than it does look like in person. So when we see the spread here at the top um, for remote between productivity, you know, work-life balance, um, and burnout and fatigue, a big difference between being entirely on site and entirely remote, um, and the hybrid is clustering much closer um, at, at the top to remote. But then in places where you might expect hybrid to balance there at the bottom where one site wins, connectivity, collaboration, exposure to leaders, folks who are remote are actually not benefiting from all of these things. And it looks more, much more like remote. See where the triangle is there at the bottom um, versus the entirely one site organization. So this is our challenge. Um, and as a leader, you know, thinking about how you can close this gap between connecti on connectivity, leadership exposure, collaboration um, for folks who are hybrid. You've got them there a couple of days a week. Why is it not clicking in the way that you hope it might? Um, we see organizations taking this problem one. Within folks who are on site, um, we do see men disproportionately benefiting from some of those pieces that pop for on-site. Um, so whether it is being like in the know or in the loop, uh, we see men reporting that they are feeling more that way than women, um, connected to an organization's mission, getting the value of sponsorship um, from being on-site, and then uh, getting feedback. So why in our on-site world are, are men able to take advantage of these things? Some of it has to do with how we run our business, how we connect, you know, do we have the mechanisms in place for regular feedback, or is it something that we need to, is it the sort of good habit, good hygiene that we need to get back to post-COVID as we renormed our workplaces? So a few things just to, to bring it home to make this practical for everybody in the room. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, three of the five here in particular, um, but you know, coming back to our overall five, fixing the broken rung, um, making sure that at that managerial transition level, you're not losing people before you have to. You're not creating a world where your pipeline is narrower down the road than it needs to be. Um, two is fine-tuning your flexible work working model. Um, are you creating an environment that learns from what we can do, what we know we can do post-COVID, gets the value that your employees value out of a flexible work model, but closes that gap between being fully remote and being fully on-site, where maybe a hybrid world gets the benefits of collaboration, the benefits of sponsorship, and a connected workplace. Next one, um, understanding that your managers, in many cases, are the ones that enable this stuff. Um, are your managers able to have feedback dialogues with, your, with employees to provide that coaching that supports in advancement from one role to the next? Um, and are they, you know, are they enabling collaboration and connectivity in how they run their teams? Um, and are they filtering that up through the organization? Or um, is there actually not as much going on there as you would hope. 
microaggressions I think can also come back to managers. Is there a team culture where folks feel like they can be their best selves? Um, or is there a world where you know, folks keep their hands down, um, where, where there is you know, a need to fit in? Um, lots of that comes back to managers as well. And then lastly, you know, setting goals and outcomes around representation. We know that we um, manage what we measure. Does your organization have visibility into what this pipeline looks like today, into how you're performing across these dimensions? Um, and are you able to manage against that data? Um, if you don't, then you probably look, you, you, our research would say that you look like the data, uh, but you're unable to take action against it. So a couple of things on this front. Um, on the broken rung, so if we fix the broken rung, what we would expect to see is that the same proportion of men and women would be advancing, um, and this would be women of color as well. We wouldn't be taking steps backward there. So the first step on this front is understanding where your organization is today. Um, is the, how prevalent is this trend in your organization? Is it true across the board? Are there particular business units or parts of the organization um, that may have more of a culture of promoting women? Is there something that you can learn from that, what's going really well? Um, but we also see here that, you know, just the more focus on the first step, steps of your pipeline uh, is where you see the value. So when you are bringing women into your workplace in the first place, what sorts of supports are there for mentorship, for apprenticeship, um, learning the ropes and, and benefiting from the investment that you're making to attract women in the first place, um, and then supporting them through that first transition. Uh, this can be in the form of career development programs. It can be more informal mentorship. Um, more of a, a concrete sponsorship focus. Um, and then lastly, you know, involving more of a people and DEI focus in performance reviews. Um, are you holding people accountable for how they are engaging with uh, earlier tenured women? Um, I know, like, it's been interesting. I've been at McKinsey for about a decade, and my starting class was the first, was the, the last class before we launched a big, uh, program that we call All In, um, Diversity and Inclusion, and our aspiration was to get our classes to, um, incoming classes of new joiners to 50% gender parity by 2030. And I think we are at 48% right now. And when I started, we were closer to, I think, 26, maybe? Um, so we, we've made an enormous gain. But when you, what you see um, at the top of the pipeline, Two years ago, there was a um, sad you know, string of emails that there had been more senior partners elected named Mark than women um, at our firm globally. And you know, at, at, you're gonna see that for a little while, um, but you have to start at the beginning and then support people well, and then look at how that cohort is progressing to be able to see the gains at the top. So I, I say this to say um, that you know, looking around at the teams that I am part of now, which um, are often 50% or more women versus the teams that I was a part of a decade ago, you see the change, it is slow, but it does take that deliberate focus at the beginning. Um, the second one of, I wanna focus on of the, the flexible work model. We're still making a lot of calls here based on intuition that we can make based on data. You know, what are folks in your organization actually looking for? Um, what do they value um, the most? Is it the opportunity to engage um, with leaders in person? Is it the opportunity to spend deep thinking or problem solving with their teams in person? Um, what's the right fit for your organization for how you spend that currency? And how can you increase the collaboration, connectivity, connectedness to the mission? Um, through the time that you spend in person while still enabling, uh, at the end of the day, the flexibility that folks might value in remote work. Um, I think maybe the one at the bottom is an important piece here of a culture and processes that don't penalize employees for working within allowable, flexible norms. This is a common sense one, but is the norm there because we felt like we needed to have a norm? Do we actually need to have a norm? 
um, is there a reason that somebody needs to be in the office on this particular day or at this particular time? If they're a strong performer, would you rather lose them um, to a different organization because you had the rule in place? Or would you rather you know, allow a little bit more mushiness in, in the policy front? Um, and then lastly, just want to focus again on the, the impact of data here in the first place. When we are looking at this regularly, when we are um, holding up the mirror for our own organizations, it shows folks that we care. It also allows us to manage toward these outcomes. Um, so organizations that are, um, you know, have policies in place and are tracking year-over-year -year performance, uh, and this looks like you know, tracking the progression of women in the workplace. It looks like understanding opportunity creation um, and the types of roles that people are taking on, you know, the diversity of teams that managers put underneath them, who they are hiring um, and who they are promoting. It does take a granular look at what you're doing and how you're operating to be able to make change. Um, from a mentorship and sponsorship standpoint in particular, these are things that if we're not understanding who people are connected to, it's almost impossible to see that I've got my hand up, but no one's reaching out to me. Um, if we can create more visibility around this, in particular with data that we track over time, um, then you can create cultural change that, that's quite exciting. So I'll pause there, and any any questions um, or reactions? I know I've got y'all during and after lunch, so. Okay, awesome, wonderful. Well, I encourage you to check out the the research, and uh, the last thing that that I'll say is. Um, I think there are some parameters on participating in the, in the um, report around industry, company size. Uh, in some industries, we don't have enough participants to be able to provide you the data back uh, because the sample size isn't big enough. But check it out. It's, it's definitely worth it if you have the opportunity to have your employees participate in the survey. Um, what you get out of it is your own data set to be able to explore. I think we've got some great tools that can let you um, look at, at quite granular levels how folks are feeling in your organization. So if the last three pages of here's what you can go do about it are not feeling like you're taking here's what I'm going to go do about it away, get the QR code, explore if you can participate, and I think you could learn a lot by holding up that mirror. Okay, thank you all.